Leviticus chapter 24 this evening. Our journey through the Bible. Again, the book of Leviticus has a theme of holiness and the holiness of God. And so he continues that theme and continues to instruct the Lord does the children of Israel on the fact that he is a holy God and how that they can properly represent him uh, as his people, as a holy people in a world that is unholy. And I heard someone say about chapter 24 that it divides into three sections. Number one, the providing of holy oil, the preparation of holy bread, and the protection of God's holy name. And uh, I, uh, I, since I can't improve on that, I just stole it. It's very, very good. I mean, there's three P's right in a row like that. It's great for memory. And it's also a very accurate way uh, to lay out the chapter. I, have, I like anything that helps me to remember or organize something in my mind. I felt that that did that. So first we begin with the providing of the holy oil. And then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Command the children of Israel, these are the children of Israel, that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives, for the light to make the lamps burn continually. And outside the veil of the testimony, in the tabernacle of meeting, that's where the, the menorah or the lampstand was, one of the three furnishings in the holy place, right outside of the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle. And uh, the only source of light in, inside the tabernacle was the, this menorah or this lampstand. So the children of Israel were to bring the pure oil that was to be used in keeping it lit. And then Aaron was to be in charge of it from evening until morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. He shall be in charge of the lamps of the pure gold lampstand before the Lord continually. And so as we looked at this back in the book of Exodus, we saw how it is that uh, what the lampstand was, its place, what it was made of, solid gold. And, and it is a, uh, again, it, it provided the only light within the tabernacle is a picture of Jesus as the light of the world. He declared himself to be uh, the light of the world. He declared us to be the light of the world also as Christians because we're filled with the same oil, the same oil of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that when uh, Jesus... Uh, lived in his his public ministry, his 33 and a half years that he was uh, on the earth prior to his crucifixion and his uh, resurrection and then his ascension into heaven. Everything that he did in his public ministry, he did in the power of the Holy Spirit. He 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 wasn't he never ceased to be divine the entire time, but he operated in the power of the Holy Spirit the same power of the Holy Spirit that's available to us. And that's why he told us that we're the light of the world because we have that same Holy Spirit available to us. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, and when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, he said, you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so we are the light of the world. The body of Christ is is the light of the world. And so we, we do it by that same power of the Spirit. Now, one of the things that's interesting here in all of this is that the supply, and this is what we're told here that's uh, additional to what we uh, found out in Exodus, the supply of the pure oil for the lampstand, it was to come from the people. And, and then the high priest was then responsible to keep the lampstand or the little cups filled with oil and the wicks there and all and, and keep it lit and make sure that it would, would never, ever go out. So what you have here is this beautiful picture. The Lord made sure that both the people and the leaders, they each had a very necessary part in keeping this light of, of the menorah or the, of the lampstand lit there in the holy place. No one was to leave it up to somebody else. Everyone was to do their part, both the, the people and the priest. And uh, there's a beautiful verse that brings this out as it relates to uh, God working through our lives 
in, in the body of Christ. It, of course, the ministry is every single Christian is a minister. We're all called. You are gifted in ways that I am not and that others are not. Uh, God has put a very uh, beautiful package together in your life for exactly what he's called you to do and be for how you're to shine the light of Jesus in in this world. And he's done that for everyone. So the the people aren't to look to the leaders to pull this off. And the leaders aren't to look and say, well, you know, we just teach and do these things. And and but the real shiny of the light that's left to the people. Everybody have a, has a place as Christians. All of us have a place in uh, allowing Jesus' light and his life, his purity to be uh, to glow out and, and to, uh, to light out into, into this uh, dark world and, and to shine. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, Paul said, that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its Share causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And so he likens the body of Christ to a body. Every body part has its important place in the function of that body, for that body to be what it's supposed to be. And every part has to do its share in order for that to be the case. And so an Old Testament truth, a New Testament truth uh, also, even in the details of how the oil was supplied uh, for the the uh, lampstand. Then uh, the showbread in verse five, and you shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes with it. Uh, the twelve cakes representing the uh, twelve tribes of Israel. Again, we saw this in Exodus chapter twenty-five. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake or or loaf, and you shall set them in two rows, and they would be on the table of showbread, which was a. a, a a furnishing, one of the three furnishings in the holy place. They were to put it be put in two rows. And I like that. They weren't just to be kind of randomly thrown on there or anything. There's a right way to do things. Decent and in order. And it sounds like the Lord's into symmetry too. So you asymmetrical people, you'll, you'll be improved by the time you get into heaven. We like you for the variety that you provide. And, and the amusement uh, that you provide to the rest of us. But um, you'll be cured of it soon enough. We know enough not to take you too seriously. Uh, so anyway, two rows, six in a row on the pure golden table before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each row that it may be on the bread for a memorial and offering made by fire to the Lord. And so what they would do is this bread would be changed out every Sabbath day, the 12 loaves, and they would bake 12 new loaves. They would be put on the place then a piece from the loaf would be uh, uh, from the old loaves would be pulled away. It would be mixed with frankincense and it would be burned on the altar. And so that's what the frankincense uh, was about. And you shall um, verse eight. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it. In a holy place, for it is most holy to him from the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. And so the 12 tribes again represent or the 12 loaves represent the 12 uh, tribes. And because these 12 loaves were in the holy place right outside of the Holy of Holies, which represented the presence of God, it was a reminder to the children of Israel that they were always in the presence of God. Of God, that they, uh, they always before me is how he puts it there, and that they were always that close to him. Now, in the Middle East, uh, the table's always a symbol of fellowship, and so it reminded the people of the constant ability to commune with God. He's that close. He not only dwells uh, with us, but for us as Christians, uh, he dwells in us. I mean, we have the most intimate fellowship you can have with God this side of heaven, and it's all because of. Of Jesus is very significant here. And again, he gives us a uh, this is not exactly like he described it in Exodus in that he gives us a little further insight uh, here. And so it must be important. Very interesting 
to note that the bread could only be eaten by the priests. The seventh day when they would put it, bring in the new bread, that bread was not to be thrown away into the garbage or for given away for people to eat. It was to be eaten by the priests. And they were to eat that bread in the presence, in fellowship, because with the high priest who would eat, uh, eat it also. So this speaks of beautiful picture of the Lord's Supper. Each of us as Christians, we are priests and uh, and, and so we get to enjoy uh, with our, our high priest, Jesus, regularly the Lord's Supper. And uh, in, in our ministry here, you have the priest there ministering to the Lord. What sustains them in that ministry with the Lord? The encouragement of the high priest, the sustenance that God gives. What keeps us moving forward in our service to the Lord, uh, living for Him, being a light for Him. It is uh, the encouragement that comes from our high priest. No one will last, I don't think, any length of time in serving the Lord uh, w- without intimacy with, with God and not, ha- and not make an impact in the world. It all comes out of that relationship. It all comes out of that fellowship with the Lord, the personal relationship. We'll never rise for any length of time above our personal relationship with the Lord. And that's one of the things that the Lord's Supper does is it brings us back to remember that this is all about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Because you can forget about Jesus even in serving the Lord. A lot of motivations for serving the Lord. Uh, There can be a lot of selfish motivations. And this keeps us focused on our high priest and communing with him as we're uh, living for him and and then serving him. Now in verse 10, the protection of the holy name of God. Now in verse 10, the protection of the holy name of God. Here's the incident. A son of an Israelite woman whose father was an Egyptian. So they're coming out of Egypt and so probably wasn't super unusual for there to be kind of a mixed marriage this way between the children of Israel uh, and an Egyptian. So here you have uh, a, 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 a young man who is uh, has a, a Israelite mother and the father is Egyptian. And he went out among the children of Israel and this Israelite woman's son and the man, a man of Israel, uh, both both parents being children of Israel, they fought each other in the camp. And so some kind of a big fight, probably physical in, in nature, broke out. And the Israelite uh, woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. And so they brought it to Moses. The mother's name was Shemeleth, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. So a fight breaks out. He curses in the midst of this fight. And in his cursing, he blasphemes the name uh, of, of the Lord. Now, he does more than just uh, uh, speak in the name of God. That was lawful. It's more than he didn't just curse or swear or use profanity. Uh, that was bad enough, but it wasn't as serious as what, what he did. Uh, this is more than just calling for God to curse the man he's fighting with. You know, God cursed this man, and that's not what happened here. He cursed the name of of the Lord. And in doing so, he cursed the Lord himself. In in the Old Testament, we we give people names as kind of an identification to differentiate them from the other six billion people on the face of the planet. And so that when we call their name across a crowded room or something, they'll recognize we're talking to them and turn, get their attention. Uh, To name someone under the whole culture of the Jews uh, a name was more than just a, 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 an identification tag that was given to them. A name represented the person. That's how they, they viewed a name. And, and so in cursing the name of the Lord, he has cursed the nature of God. He has cursed the Lord himself, who and what the Lord uh, is. And so he calls for a curse, somehow a curse against the Lord, something like may such and such and you insert a terrible thing happen to the Lord or, you know, curse the Lord, curse Yahweh or some kind of thing that he would say, maybe even a stronger kind of way. And that's what he does here. Well, the response of the children of Israel is he's brought now to uh, Moses and all They put them in custody that the mind of the Lord might be shown to them. This is the first time they've run into this. They didn't know what to do. 
So they're seeking the mind of the Lord. What does God think about what's just happened here? Now, they knew from the law of Moses in Exodus that it was forbidden to use the name of the Lord in vain. But what's the punishment for that? And did the law of Moses apply to a mixed parent situation? There's some things that they didn't know. And to Moses' credit and give him credit, when he didn't know what the mind of the Lord was on that, he didn't bluff. He just said, we don't know what the mind of the Lord is on this. Let's seek him and find out what it is that he has to say. You know, life is like that. Life, have you ever noticed that life is just kind of unfolding you know, 24 hours at a time? And you're hitting things all the time that you say, wow, what do we do here? I mean, I, I, we kind of are living right here at this moment. I mean, most of us in the room. And uh, so we've been able to process life Thus far, in the light of the Word of God, test it by the Word, make our decisions based on the Word. But tomorrow comes and we hit something like, wow, I never thought I'd see that. I don't know what to do there. And, and then we have to seek the Lord and seek His Word for how do we handle ourselves in this situation. And uh, that's not to bluff when you don't know. As a husband in a marriage, don't bluff. I don't have the mind of the Lord in this. I need to find out what it is. Or as parents... As we hit these new things. And that's what they do. They, and now they're going to seek the Lord for his direction and his mind. And so uh, then all who had, uh, so they, they uh, took him into custody. And the Lord did have a mind related to this. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, take outside the camp him who is cursed. And then let all who heard him, the eyewitnesses, let them lay their hands on his head. And then let all of the congregation stone him. If you're going to carry. So this blaspheming the Lord in this way and cursing God in this way, capital crime. But he wanted the accusers to be right there, lay their hands on him when the execution began because they had to stand. He had a right to, to, to face his accusers and, uh, and to stand there and, and hold to their word and to their testimony. And then let all of the congregation Stone him, And these shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin, and whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall surely stone him, the stranger as well as him who is born in the land, so Gentiles and, and Jews alike. And then the, when, the Lord, when he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. Death, And so the pronouncement that this now was a capital crime. Well, God has a, a, obviously a zero tolerance uh, for this, this kind of thing, for his name and for him to be spoken of. And, and uh, not just in a, in a casual way, but in a, in a way that's derogatory toward him or, or openly curses him. And, and so the Lord, obviously, he didn't want one tiny little smallest amount of this attitude to be introduced among his people at all. And it applied to anyone that lived within the borders of Israel. You, can, you were a Gentile, come, you know, from Ethiopia or uh, come from Italy or come from anywhere and you came and settled into, Is into the land of Israel under the law of Moses, then you had to respect that law. It was for Jew and Gentile living in, in the land. So God is clearly wanting to nip this kind of thing at the bud. This self-willed rebellion is very, very dangerous. But nobody thinks anything of it today, do they? Because if this man blasphemes God, gets up and says whatever he wants about God and blasphemes him and, and all of this, what will the next generation do? They'll do worse. And then what will the generation do after that? They'll do even more worse. And the problem is, is that we look at it, sometimes people can struggle with it and they can say, well, boy, we understand murder being a capital crime, but I mean blaspheming God, a capital crime. But which one of them does the greater damage in the eyes of God? Not minimizing murder, but the consequences are at least temporal. To blaspheme God and then to lead 
the generation behind you even to greater kind of blasphemy against God and to sense a, a freedom to do what you've done and more, that has eternal consequences. Because that's the kind of thing that turns people away from God. God is misrepresented. They say, I don't want to know a God like that. I don't want to, you know, we can do whatever we want with God or, or anything like this. And then people's eternities are at stake. And so God just nips the whole thing right at, at, at the bud. You know, we live in a country that um, we don't know where this is going. Because we are, we are right in the middle. And I don't know where the middle is. But we haven't hit a place where one generation outdoing the other generation in terms of wickedness, in terms of unrighteousness by God's standard, in terms of a freedom to just blaspheme God and say whatever they want to say about God, that, that free fall, we, we don't even know that we're even near hitting bottom on that because we're just seeing generation after generation worse and worse and worse and worse. Where does it lead? Where does it lead? And will anyone want to live in a country like that? I will tell you where it leads. It will lead the same place it led the children of Israel into captivity to the Assyrians and to the Babylonians. It leads to bondage and it leads to destruction. That's where it leads. It doesn't matter what the gross national product of a nation is. It doesn't matter what kind of military they have. It doesn't matter what kind of business expertise they have. That's where it leads. When the, when the moral base of the country... Uh, collapses because of a disrespect for the true and the living God, you, you end up with hell on earth. And that's exactly what's going to happen in the Great Tribulation for the, the whole wide world. So where does God draw the line? You say, wow, that's so, so, so hard. He's so harsh there. Where do you draw the line? You draw the line in the third generation? How hard is it to reel the whole thing back at that point? How hard would it be to reel back our nation back to a morality that existed? I don't say in terms of experience, uh, what people were actually doing physically with their lives, but at least the definition of right and wrong. How hard would it be back to take this back to the 1930s and 40s? You see, it would be an uproar. It would be impossible to do. We're not a theocracy. I understand that. Is, is the United States of America. But the further it's allowed to go, the harder it is to take control of it again. So the Lord just steps in and says, I know how to deal with it. You just erase it as it shows up. And if anyone is so filled with their own self-importance that they're willing to elevate that uh, and their self-expression above the health and the spiritual eternity of an entire nation, I don't have a problem with silencing their voice. That's what he does. And for me, I don't have a problem with it. But I'm born again now. So I have a desire to live that kind of life. And I have a respect for God. And I have a respect for, for His Word and for His standard. So no man has a right to do that, to blaspheme God in that way. Wow. I hope everyone in the entertainment industry in the United States of America is saved. <laughs> Does it face the judgment? Think, I mean, just think about how free people are to just portray him, say the worst things about him, misrepresent him. I don't even want to get into public education. But it, it just is terrible. And it's a big, big deal. And God uses this incident in the Old Testament to just let, let him know what a big deal that it is. What if God just opened up our eyes just for five minutes to just show us the price that the world is paying because of it, its protection of the right to blaspheme God. God's going to take care of it. I don't think we should, you know, we can't take this in our hands and, and, and do this kind of thing. But you look at the, 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 the uh, what would the world be like if his righteousness, who he was, his righteous standard was the thing that was extolled and honored and, and respected versus tearing that down and fighting against it all of the time. You see, what the world would be on one hand uh, under that, the beauty of that, and then what it, it, it is uh, on a daily basis because of its blasphemy against him. And God looks at it and says, I see the 
the casualties every day all over the world. I see what happens to children all over the world. I see what happens to old people all over the world because of, of this kind of thing. And so he puts it out. He says, zero tolerance for this. And whoever puts, kills any man uh, shall surely be put to death. And so capital punishment uh, related to murder, not talking about accidental death or manslaughter, is talking about uh, deliberate uh, premeditated murder. Now, this, this law goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood by, his, uh, by man, his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. So he holds tight to this capital punishment uh, for, uh, for murder. And whoever kills an animal shall make it good animal for animal. So restitution was to occur. If you killed a, your neighbor's a animal and uh, whatever it, it might be, you had to repay that uh, exactly. And one ox of the same condition, same age, same shape for the ox that you killed or whatever, or horse or mule or whatever it, it, it might be. So restitution related to animals. If a man causes disfigurement of his neighbor... Uh, as he is done, so it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he has caused disfigurement of a man, so it shall be done to him. So he's lying in wait. He's got a club in his hand, jumps out from behind a tree, and he uh, proceeds to beat the guy within an inch of his of his uh, of death. And and what was the punishment for that? Equal, right across. And, and one of these things of this whole eye for eye, tooth for tooth thing, three, three reasons for it. Number one, to establish a very strong sense of law and order in the nation of Israel. To put a fear of God and a fear of, of law and order in the hearts and minds of criminals. And the, the second reason for it was eye for eye, tooth for tooth, was in order that no um, sentence that would be meted out for a crime against another person, that it wouldn't be too lenient where you would uh, give a hand for an eye. And then what happens with the population of a nation where the sentences are too lenient? They're going to be tempted to take the law into their own hands, and God didn't want that. It's also a protection against sentences that were too strong where you would take an eye for a hand. And that was very strong, a very strong kind of thing in that culture in those days, the surrounding nations, where they thought nothing of, okay, you do this to me, I'm going to do twice to you. And God said, no, we don't want to run the nation that way. It'll be eye for an eye and, and a tooth uh, for a tooth. And so this was the, the way that God wanted in terms of these you know, other kinds of laws of assault and how, how this, you know, the sentencing was to be, it was to be guided by that. And every once in a while you'll, you know, drive down the road or something and read somebody's uh, bumper sticker. And there's hardly anything uh, except network news. It's more uh, uh, irritating sometimes than to read bumper stickers. But I do it anyway. I'm incurable. And uh, sometimes you read some uh, really good ones. But every once in a while I'll see... You know, one that says something like this. An eye for an eye leaves everyone blind. Oh. So they're just, you know, they're slamming the Old Testament and slamming the law of Moses and the whole thing. And you say, you know, I mean, it really sounds, yeah, that's right. If we do an eye for an eye, we're going to all end up blind. We've got to stop this kind of, of thing. You, you carry it out, you won't want to live in a country that, you know... Bumper sticker philosophy is shallow philosophy in, in, in general. So it, it really sounds good on a bumper sticker, but it doesn't work out so well in real life in this fallen world. Because if you do it that way, then what you're going to end up with is all of the good people with their eyes gouged out and all of the bad people with their sight. Wake up! What world are you living in? <laughs> Oh, listen, I don't want to take your eye out. Gouge my other one out, too. You know, and then we'll be at the mercy of evil every, uh, everywhere. So God's a God of law and order. Old Testament, New Testament. People think, wow, that's very strong there. I'm glad that we're in the New Testament. We don't really care. Uh, we're not as strong there. It is Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. talks very much about law and order. 
um, forces that are in, in, uh, uh, in place within a country to protect its, its citizens from crime and, and the anarchy within the borders of, of the land and from invasion from without. And, and, and uh, the Lord says that they don't hold that the sword in vain, you know, in terms of capital punishment or in terms of using the ultimate force to maintain law and order. And so these, uh, these uh, principles, the same in the New Testament, whoever kills an animal shall restore it, but whoever kills a man shall be put to death. Uh, man is, this will be shocking for some, man is more valuable than animals. Now, I do not say that man is better behaved than animals. Uh, there's, you can almost give me a dog any old time over about 90% of the population. But, but in terms of value in the eyes, because man was created in the image of God. And, and so the one was to be restored, the other resulted in death. And you shall have the same law for the stranger for, and for uh, one from your own country. So foreigners living in Israel or children of Israel themselves, this was the law no matter what. No double standard. And then Moses spoke to the children of Israel and they took outside of the camp him who had cursed and stoned him with stones. And so the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded uh, Moses chapter 25 and the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai saying speak to the children of Israel and say to them when you come into the land which I give you it's God's land first and foremost then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord six years you shall sow your field and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit and but in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land a Sabbath.